Hello, I'm Dr. Ira Nash. Welcome to Well Said. Today, we'll be discussing the possible connection between social media and mental health. As teens spend an increasing amount of time on popular social media platforms like TikTok and Instagram, there's been a parallel rise in rates of depression and anxiety among young people, especially girls. This has led many experts to question the role social media has played in fueling this mental health epidemic. Joining me to discuss this important topic is my colleague, Dr. Victor Fornari. Dr. Fornari is the Chief of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Long Island Jewish Medical Center and a Professor of Psychiatry and Pediatrics at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, and I'm delighted to welcome Victor back to Well Said. Thank you very much for inviting me. So, Victor, when I had you on the show previously, we were talking about the mental health impact of the COVID pandemic. And before we start talking about social media, uh, can you provide our listeners with a brief update on the, uh, I guess, the uh, lingering effects of the pandemic on, on kids' mental health? I believe that we're going to see a cohort effect that the generation who survived the pandemic, it will have an impact on their social skills, their level of anxiety, and the remnants, the memories of what social isolation meant, the particular experiences, that, how it impacted their family and friends. And over time, we'll see. But overall, the levels of anxiety and depression in children and adolescents nearly doubled from baseline during the pandemic. And we've seen levels leveling off but they haven't gone back to pre-pandemic levels. Wow. So that's a lot of kids. Um, and gets me to my next question, which was in my intro, I used the phrase mental health epidemic. Uh, do you think that's a fair characterization? And, and how would you describe in general the state of mental health in kids today? Well, the Surgeon General declared a mental health crisis in our youth several months ago because of the dramatic increase over the past decade of depression and suicide in adolescents. And we know that the dramatic increase in anxiety fueled by the pandemic and the very real caution that society was asked to take in mm -hmm. order to prevent contagion for those people who were predisposed to anxiety and depression really led to fueling uh, an over-exaggeration of fear such that there are many youngsters who haven't gone back to school for fear. Wow. So can you give us some numbers like how, how many kids are we talking about here? Pre-pandemic, about 10% of youth under the age of 18 meet the diagnostic criteria for at least one anxiety disorder. These include generalized anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, simple phobias, and you said that's pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic. One in 10. Correct. So that sounds like a pretty high number. It's very high. Before anything Correct. got crazy. And no pun intended. Exactly. Yeah. And many of these are disorders that are genetically based in families where there's high levels of anxiety disorder amongst parents, as well as the family environment. So it's both a genetic predisposition, yeah. as well as the family environment of worrying. During the pandemic, those rates doubled and the estimate was about 20% of youth met criteria for at least one anxiety disorder, and those rates have really not come down substantially. So what are the numbers now? About 20% of the population of youth are still anxious and meeting criteria for an interfering disorder. Wow. And the base rates for depression also went up dramatically, whereas prior to the pandemic, uh, probably close to 8% of Adolescent girls were depressed, and during the pandemic, it doubled. Depression in childhood is less common, probably about 3%, but it also doubled to about 5 to 6%. And adolescent boys, it increased, but not to the level as adolescent girls. Wow. So a lot of kids out there who were hurting in, in one way or another, uh, you connected the rise in these rates to the pandemic. I wanted to shift our focus a little bit to talk about social media. Is that fair? Do you think that social media and the use of these online platforms is driving the persistence of these high rates or driving them higher? So let's go back historically. Around 2010, the smartphone was introduced. By 2012, the large majority of youth had access to a smartphone in their hand. 
And just to find youth, so we're talking about the same age 12 range. to 17. 12 to 17, okay. There are some youth who have access to it younger than 12, but it's not as common. Mm -hmm. 12 to 17, it's pretty common for kids today to have a smartphone. Okay. The smartphone offers them the idea that they have a telephone, but it's really a handheld computer. Sure. They have access to the internet, social media, and although there are many advantages to having ready access to both some social media and some internet access, the dark side far outweighs the potential benefits. And for vulnerable youth, there is no question that pre-pandemic, in the years 2012 to 2020, there was already a dramatic increase in suicidal behavior amongst adolescents. And you think that that's not just a correlation between these things, but a causal link between these I two? I believe it's fueled by it. And some lines of evidence suggest if you ask the developers and owners of the social media companies, they say, we would never let our kids be on social media. They understand the potential risks, and yet the public doesn't seem to fully understand that these really are serious potential risks. So we're really dealing with kind of a double whammy here. Correct. Wow. Okay. So, um, so what is it about the use of social media or these uh, online platforms that make it so toxic for, for kids? First of all, there's vulnerability. So not everybody is going to have a negative impact. But for the vulnerable youth, perhaps those with anxiety or pre-existing depressed mood, they find out in real time when they've been betrayed, when they've been bullied, when someone has lied to them about a party that they said they weren't invited to and then they see the photographs and they feel excluded and they feel hurt and they feel really uh, very distressed about that. And the things that people will say on social media, one would rarely say face to face. So much like texting, things that people report on social media, it's like a harpoon. So oftentimes kids will sign on to social media and then suddenly they'll feel devastated because they'll learn something or someone has said something to them publicly on a social media platform that is extremely hurtful. So it's, it almost sounds like kind of a, um, an exaggeration of some of the, the kind of toxic interactions that kids of a certain age tend to have anyway. Is that, is that fair? It may be, but also it's in such real time 24-7 so normally we think that, you know, bedtime comes, kids, lights out, go to sleep. But many youth go to sleep with their hand held in their, in their hands. Yeah. And every time it vibrates or it buzzes, they'll turn on the light and they'll check their text or they'll check their social media. And really, they're not, they don't escape from it 24-7. So they're, they're kind of marinating in this social milieu and this constant comparison. And when there's toxicity and negativity, there's no way to support them and to offer them any kind of guidance because they're alone in their bed. And I think we saw that a great deal during the pandemic because kids were really on home instruction yeah, for the most part for a period of time, and they had extra time to be on social media and on the internet. And so we really found that both the social isolation, not being in school with their peers, their activities, their sports, but being isolated and now being more vulnerable, spending time on social media and on the internet uh, really uh, increased, uh, exacerbated uh, the negative effects. You know, there's, there's an obvious and sort of tragic irony here. We're, we're talking about social isolation and loneliness through the use of a product that is at least intended to bring people together. And for certain, there are many silver linings to social media and the internet. We can have access to information in ways that would have taken us time to research in a library before. Uh, we, have, we can make contact with friends and colleagues and family members around the globe instantly. So there are certainly advantages. The, the risk is that the content of many of the messages are very toxic. Yeah, speak to that a little bit more. What about those messages or, or what kids see is particularly damaging or destructive, especially for, for young people? You know, during adolescence, kids do a lot of comparing. And images, particularly of body configurations, hair, facial configuration, makeup, clothing, 
suddenly kids are criticized. They're made to feel like uh, young women feel fat. They feel like they've been uh, teased or bullied. Uh, I can't believe what you're wearing. I can't believe the way you looked. And suddenly they're alone with their device and they've been criticized publicly and they're made to feel like there's something seriously wrong with them. So it's embarrassing, it's humiliating, and for vulnerable kids, it's really toxic. Now, there are many resilient kids who say, I'm not dealing with this nonsense, and they're off. But many kids are, become so addicted to it because like many habits that we have, there's a very addictive quality to the use of social media and the internet. Well, you said earlier that the people who have created these things often restrict their own children's access. Is that related to this sort of addictive quality? It's the, the addictive quality as well as the dark side of both the internet and social media. We know that parental controls are an effort to try to prevent kids from having access to certain internet sites or social media sites that parents want to restrict. However, we know that savvy kids know how to get around it. Right. And yeah. so those parental controls are not very effective, and suddenly kids are exposed to things which can be really very difficult to resist. You know, we've talked on this show about substance abuse and, and a more, I guess, conventional use of the word addiction. And I know You've studied this and used that word in a very deliberate way, but I wonder if you could speak a little bit more to the similarities that use of these devices and in, in these platforms has to what we would think of more of like drug abuse. Right. Well, we know that there are certain activities that really uh, derive pleasure. If you eat a, a delicious cookie or a cake, you say, wow, that feels so good, because when that sensation of pleasure is experienced, dopamine is released in the brain. Okay. And we'll say, oh, well, I'd like another one. I don't know if I can resist that. That was really good. Even though you say, oh, I really shouldn't have it. But, you know, it's hard to resist. So those cravings, whether it's for a cookie or for a drug or for social media or for an Internet site, are really driven by dopamine. Dopamine is very powerful as a neurotransmitter to mediate pleasure, but that pleasure also is associated with cravings, which is why so many addictions are difficult to treat, because the cravings persist even long after the substance is used, and the individual will say, all right, just one more time, and then I won't use it again. And so the cravings for certain substances like cocaine, like heroin, are so powerful that the individual says, you know, my own capacity to really try to withstand and not use isn't strong enough. The craving overpowers me. And so I think what happens with social media, and certainly we see with video games and different kinds of uh, internet interactions that youth have, that the craving really drives them to it. And if you say, leave your smartphone in another room, they're like, I can't even walk out of the room with it. My hand needs it. I need to check how many times before 7 a.m. have people checked their texts, their emails, their WhatsApp. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's become something that we all crave as well. If I leave the house in the morning, and I venture to guess if you leave the house without your smartphone, you turn around and go back and get it if you realize Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And the truth is, I remember the day when we said, you know, I'm really happy. Nobody can reach me till I get to my office. It's <laughs> right. good. Right. But those days are over. Yeah. So, um, wow, so many, it, it, so many things come to mind. So uh, you, you talked about cocaine and heroin in the same breath that you were talking about social media. Is the craving as intense? Well, there's a degree. So we know, for example, that the different pleasurable experiences, whether it's food or a drug or sexuality, derives a different level of response. However, it's within the range such that the cravings, I think, that people develop from cocaine and heroin surpass the craving to intimacy. Yeah. So the studies have shown that if you show uh, individuals a three-minute pornographic video and they've never been exposed to cocaine or heroin, they're aroused. If you show the same number of people who've been exposed to cocaine or heroin the same pornographic video, 
they're not aroused by it. But if you show them white powder, their brain lights up on a PET scan. Wow. Well, that, that relates to another question I was going to ask, that the typical nature of, an, of a substance addiction is that you need more and more of it to get the same level of um, pleasure or, or the same dopamine response, I guess. It, is that also true of the use of social media, meaning do you have to do more and more of it to s fulfill that craving? I think that's a research question I don't have the answer to. All I know is that young people are feeling that they're compelled to check, and it's very hard to resist that desire, that craving to check what's going on. You know, they call it fear of missing out or FOMO. But yeah. the truth is that FOMO is really the craving to check because they know that they haven't been able to, to find out what's going on now. And how does that sense of craving or fear of separation from the device play into that sense of anxiety and depression that we were talking about earlier? Well, I think for vulnerable youth, it does. So, ex for example, kids want to feel connected. They want to see what's happening. And so they want to see what their friends are saying, what their friends are doing. They see the photographs. And their intention is to be belong and be part of it. But the effect oftentimes is they end up feeling left out, criticized, betrayed. So although the initial intention is to really belong, oftentimes the consequence is a betrayal. Yeah, which uh, again is just so deeply ironic, right? I mean, the, these things are designed to bring people together and, and what we are describing is a lot of kids suffering alone uh, with their phones. Right. In fact, there are some wonderful cartoons of a mom walking by her daughter's room and the daughter's sitting on her bed looking at her phone. And the caption the mother's saying is, it's so nice she's talking to her friends. And the caption the child is thinking is, I can't believe I wasn't invited to the party. Yeah. So the family doesn't really know what the child's experiencing. All they know is that they're on social media. And you mentioned in that cartoon and earlier in our conversation, uh, you referenced girls uh, more so than boys. Uh, talk a little bit more about the gender differences that, that you've observed professionally in the impact of this. Adolescent girls are more vulnerable to rejection and depression. A sense of belonging, self-esteem, uh, appearance, identity is more vulnerable. And so they're at higher risk for developing depression. Adolescent boys are more impulsive. So when they are depressed or are impulsive, they're more likely to die by suicide, even though adolescent girls are more common to attempt suicide. Mm. So even though adolescent girls may attempt suicide 10 times more commonly ten times as boys, adolescent boys, when they attempt, die 10 times more commonly than the girl. Oh, my God. So there's yeah. a very dramatic difference in, in the means. Adolescent girls tend to take pills or cut themselves. Adolescent boys will jump, use a noose, or use a gun. Yeah. Um, so that's all pretty grim. Uh, I, I want to go beyond the, the interactions that the kids are having with their phones for a moment and ask you whether there's an impact that you see on their interactions outside of the use of social media. So how does this affect kids' ability to interact in, I guess, in the old-fashioned way, face-to-face uh, -face with peers or with their families. Well, if you've been to a teenage party recently, you'll Can't see... Can't say that I have, but... You'll see kids sitting around a couch and a coffee table, and everyone is on their smartphone one-on-one, -on -one, and they're together. They're each doing it separately. And so people are hanging out, even in groups, on their cell phone. They can't resist checking what's going on. So, so I guess the answer is yes, this is having an impact. A on, huge impact. Yeah. It's changed the way people relate to one another. Kids will have play dates, and each one will be on their respective smartphone doing their own thing. Are they communicating with each other? Often or not. So it's back to like parallel pa play. Parallel play for kids. Yeah. Wow. Um, I want to go back to something else you mentioned before as a possible strategy for dealing with this, and it's the whole question of parental controls. And as I understand it, 
that takes several different forms, or at least a- attempts at different forms. So either something baked into the the device or the application that says, you know, you have to get your parents' permission for this. And I guess a, a, a more draconian version of that, which is in some states now, you can't even like download the app unless you're of a certain age or you get parental permission. Um, so two questions. Is that uh, an appropriate response and if it is is it working well look we restrict access to material on a newsstand for kids who are minors but they have access to the internet with limited restriction so there's a great movement today to try to support parents getting together to delay the introduction of the smartphone with internet to their kids They can have access to a flip phone for communication, texting, phone calls, but not having access to the Internet and social media, at least until 16, which is currently what the Surgeon General is recommending. But I imagine there's great social pressure. The kids come home and says, uh, but all my friends have a smartphone. Correct. And then it depends on parents getting together, often on a PTA, saying, "Let's, let's try to have a community effort amongst like-minded people to say, really, in the best interest of our kids, we want to delay the introduction of the internet and social media on their phones. And have there been any successes in that regard? It's a new movement. And I think only since the Surgeon General has declared this as a serious public health problem and really recommended to parents to really not allow kids to have access to social media and the internet on their smartphones till age 16, So this is a new frontier, and I hope that parents will catch on and take lessons from the developers and owners of the social media platforms who won't allow their children to be on social media because they know the potential pitfalls. Yeah, so speak for a moment to those parents. So imagine you're talking to a room full of parents of teenage kids. Um, They just heard all the, the dire things we've been talking about. What's your advice to them? Well, I think the reason to have a cell phone for a child is communication. So parents often want to know, where are you? If I want to reach you, I want you to call me when you get to where you're going. Text me. So the the reason to have a, a cell phone, a flip phone, if you would, without Internet and social media, is just to communicate. Pick me up. A phone as a phone. As a phone, as an old-fashioned phone. It's not a phone anymore. It's a handheld computer. And I think that parents really now are learning that, you know, there are certain basic rights, food, shelter, clothing, access to, you know, safety. A cell phone and a smartphone is not a basic right. And I think that kids today often have develop the idea that my friends have it so you know that's my right and you can't take it away and speaking of taking it away once you offer a child a smartphone like an addiction it's very hard to take game it away. over right every time i hear stories of parents who try to discipline their kids to take away the cell phone it ends up with many dire circumstances kids try to kill themselves because they've been punished and their cell phone's been taken away well they're going through some form of withdrawal correct right Right. yeah it's like their oxygen they can't breathe um so much more uh much better idea to try to prevent that dependency than to try to interrupt it once it and the other thing i would say is if the parent decides that they want to remove the cell phone or the smartphone from the child, it has to be a very careful plan outlining the steps and then be very mindful that the child may have a very strong reaction because we've seen such serious reactions from taking away the smartphone. So not a something uh, out of anger, not, not impulsive. impulsive, grounding. I'm grounding you and I'm taking your phone away. And I told a group of families this week, I said, and if you are going to take away their laptop, their iPad, or their smartphone, don't send them to their room. Sit with them. Sit with them. Talk to them. Try to understand it. Don't be angry. The problem is oftentimes those consequences occur in the heat of anger because someone's been disrespectful or someone's violated something that they were supposed to do. And so families get heated up. And then parents will often say or do things in a more impulsive way with anger. And we've seen 
kids who really impulsively behave in very dangerous ways to punish their parents for punishing them. Yeah. They didn't really want to die. They wanted to get back at their parents. See what you made me do. Exactly. It's your fault. Yeah. I tried to jump out the window because you took away my iPad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds absurd on the face of it, but I know this is a very real... If we weren't seeing it every day, I wouldn't be telling you about it. Yeah. Uh, let me flip that um, access to the internet uh, question a little bit to talk about uh, youth that are in vulnerable categories where the access to the internet may actually be sort of a lifeline. And I'm thinking specifically of LG LGBTQ kids or kids who are in an abusive home or something like that. Can you just speak to that question? Well, as I said earlier, there's no question that there are silver linings to both the internet and social media. We have access to information. We have access to contacts with colleagues. So there are definitely pluses. The challenge, of course, is that there are dark sides, which we often can't prevent or limit. And usually until the brain develops by age 16, most kids don't have the capacity to really censor themselves. And recently I had a situation where a 13-year-old was given a smartphone and like many 13-year-old boys, he kind of explored it and found out that in 10 seconds he could get to some pornography, and then he didn't realize that every time he turned on his phone, something popped up, and he was mortified. He said, oh my gosh, this is, this is on the face of the phone. So he brought it to his parents, and he says, return it. I don't want it. Hmm. Just get me a flip phone. And this kid was mature beyond his years. Other yeah. kids might have just concealed it and not done anything about it, but it's so tempting. Right, so he recognized the seductive and destructive nature. He said, I, I, I can't yeah. resist this. Take it away. Yeah. So we're coming to the end of our conversation here, and I, I wonder um, if you could give some either broad advice or, or just um, directions where people can get more information, where they can navigate these waters more effectively for their families and their kids? I think parents really need to become familiar with the Surgeon General's recent recommendations. And because this is a new frontier, parents really need to recognize that there are potential pitfalls to both social media and the internet on the smartphone and try to delay as much as possible the introduction of these devices to their youth, ideally until 16, but if not, with conversations. Talk to kids about their use. And, of course, parents can also look at the phone and say, in order for you to have it, I need to have access so I could see where you've been on social media and the Internet. And if the child says no, then that may be a reason to consider delaying it because the child isn't willing to participate in that kind of safe use of a smartphone. Yeah, I can imagine... That's not an easy conversation to have. No, but it's better to have it before you give the smartphone than afterwards. Yeah. Well, Victor, thank you so much. Uh, I feel like I've learned a lot, and uh, I'm sure our listeners are have benefited from, uh, from your expertise. Well, I appreciate it, and I hope that people recognize that one of the silver linings of the pandemic is that mental health has been brought to a public conversation and that there is no health without mental health. And hopefully people realize that mental illness is identifiable, it's treatable, and people really can recover. Great. That's a great place to end it. So my guest has been Dr. Victor Fornari. He's the Chief of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Long Island Jewish Medical Center and a Professor of Psychiatry and Pediatrics at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. Uh, thanks also to Abigail Feta for researching this topic and to our editor, Jared Bassman, and to our producer, Connor, Connor Pinkleton, and our audio engineer, John Mullen. For more information about this program and to find all of our past episodes, please visit our website at medicine.hofstra.edu slash well said. You can also subscribe to our free podcast wherever you get your podcast by just searching for Well Said with Dr. Ira Nash. Our listeners are welcome to send comments, suggestions, and questions to wellsaid at hofstra.edu. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ira Nash, and that's Well Said.